It's episode 29 of the Metal Insight podcast from Metal Ireland, nearly up to the first 30, and this one is with a really, really special band. You know, it's getting into winter time now, and of course that means we're all going back to our record collections and digging out the longer, darker, heavier and more reflective music to spin through these lengthening winter nights. Now, one of the best such albums in recent years like this was by... Yob, the band from Oregon in the USA, and that album was, of course, clearing the path to ascend. The band were on tour recently, so I decided to seek them out for a chat about what exactly it is that goes into this really intricate, complicated and and kind of shape-shifting doom that they make. It's difficult music, it's long, it's drawn out, it goes from one movement to the next in a way that doom usually doesn't. But like bands like Ahab, they've they've just got a special something and I wanted to find out more about it. They were so special that they were picked up by Steve Von Till of Neurosis to find a home on his Neurot record label. So I met up with guitarist and vocalist Mike Scheidt from the band while the sound checks were happening at their recent show because I wanted to talk through what it is that makes them special. I hope you enjoy it because they're one of the more intriguing and, and unique bands out there. So, it's the Metal Ireland podcast number 29, produced and reported by MetalIreland.com. If you're new to this podcast, welcome. Check out all the other episodes we got, and of course our website, MetalIreland.com, which is the home of Irish metal since 2001. Now, on with the show. It's been two years since Clearing came out. It got kind of very rave reviews at the time. Maybe more so than the last ones did. Um, How's it been in the last two years? It's been great. Certainly, um, the reviews have been, like you said, consistently good, uh, kind of overwhelmingly good. And and, uh, the response over the last couple of years certainly hasn't diminished as far as us playing any of that material live. Um, I think particularly Marrow. Uh, strikes a chord um, at all the live shows and I don't think we've been able to play a live show since the album's come out without being able to play that Um, and uh, um, so yeah whenever something that you do that you feel 100% about yourself is then received so well on similar terms it's it's amazing it's funny because in many ways it was never not going to be great and never not going to be received very well because you knew the instant you looked at the artwork that great thought had gone into this thing. It was just apparent immediately and the music reflected that. How much of a big deal was that artwork to you? Because I think a lot of people do find that artwork pretty special. Well, Orion um, Landau, who's the main um, kind of graphics artist for Relapse for the last what, you know, well over God, 30 years, um, he we've talked about working together for a long time and when I gave him some of the demos and we got together over you know lunch and just had a rough gave him some really rough ideas of kind of where we wanted to go conceptually and um, there's a couple of drafts that we felt like yeah that's in there you know but you know let's you know we wanted to have artwork that didn't have a focal point of like eyeballs looking back at you. Um, we wanted to be esoteric, but without symbols. You don't surely not a screaming skull. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we wanted it to be dark, but also have a feeling of like of depth that's mm-hmm. more than just darkness. And um, and so then he showed us that and said, "Well, let's. What do you think about this as like a, a next step?" And we just really all sat there, and I think he also sat with it too. We was with it. this is it. Mm-hmm. This is absolutely it. This is done. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was uh, quite amazing. I mean, the sort of sense of like one, two, three in it. I mean, it sort of looks like either maybe. I don't know, it, it could be a Kabbalah sort of reference, it could be chakra, who knows what it could be, it could be anything. Yeah, we wanted it to be open-ended, yeah. you know, and, and open to interpretation, but still have the heft and weight of something that, yeah, that, that touches on um, the esoteric. So, I suppose, uh, clearing the path to ascend, what was in the way of the path? I mean, what's in the way? 
<laughs> um, well, that's, you know, that's um, open to interpretation as well. And I sure know for myself what that is. And um, the album was created towards working through some of those things in myself and um, the music kind of being a vehicle and a medicinal mm -hmm. um, process. And what were they? Oh, it's a, uh, you know, I mean, I've been pretty vocal about it, you know, depression, right. you know, particularly okay. clinical depression, but um, uh, also, you know, all the stuff that you get fed from day one. and just making some some positive steps and taking responsibility for myself and uh, getting help and not just white knuckling it by myself mm -hmm. and um, you know making healthy healthier decisions and keeping a network of people that I trust um, that can hear me out and uh, as a result um, things have been much better Really interesting because I, I don't know if you're familiar. There's a band, um, death metal band from the UK called Ackercock. Oh, of course, I'm yeah, a you know, gigantic yeah. fan. Okay, well, you know, recently um, was it Paul or Jason Mendonca, I think, or one of the other guys from the band, um, came out and said, "You know what? This new album that we're about to put out—it's not actually out yet, touring at the moment." He said, "Look, this is actually about positivity. This album because he said I haven't had my troubles to seek either. I've had problems, and this album we've pushed." positivist kind of messages into not messages, a positivist spirit of attack, you know, into it to sort of counter that and to get him through which I thought was fascinating because you think of Akakok and you think of just balls to the wall you know, sort of nasty death metal but uh, Yeah, well, you know, I think you know, I'm not trying to put words in their mouth and certainly I respect um, I know Jason a little bit from over the years and respect him greatly so I'm not putting words in his mouth either um, though I do think that their, what I interpret as their brand of Satanism is certainly a little more towards self-empowerment mm. and thinking for oneself mm. and, um, and it's really more good than it is evil. You know, the evil would be more like the puritanical misinterpretation of human empowerment um, in my very remedial estimation mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah I think there's enough crap and horrible shit happening in the world I think that you know obviously horror movies and metal and things that unabashedly ex explore the dark side of life it does uh, create an outlet for what is there and maybe a means of processing that kind of darkness in a way that that you know, idealisms that avoid it or try to transform it without accepting it or even looking at it. Um, you know, it's like you don't even know what it is that you're working with. Um, and so therefore, how could you possibly even see it in yourself? Mm -hmm. And then how often do we see that darkness come out on the side of, you know, religions that are mm -hmm. supposedly all about good, supposedly all about love, and yet there's this dark core that just, you know, incessantly gets, you know, combed over. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, at the end of the day, to me, um, I love every kind of, of, well, not every kind of, you know, there's, I love horror movies, I love dark music, but my bent in life is definitely towards, uh, positivity and not towards, um, 
exemplifying negativity or exemplifying what's shitty in the world, particularly when it's often there's, a, for those that were writing about it, there's a bit of a distance from it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's mm-hmm. not like they're... It's not like, you know, there's true suffering in many doom metal bands' lives. It's well, never well, not like in a, you know, not like not being able to eat or, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, or, you know, having a limb blown off by a bomb or, or just the ability, the privilege to be able to write and record mm-hmm. a record, mm-hmm. you know, I mean... There's all sorts of levels of suffering, so I'm not saying one's better than, or worse than, or different than, but um, it's, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I I feel, you know, I don't like to focus on what I don't like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather focus on what I do like. You know, I had a friend tell me, I was telling him about a record that I loved, he's like, you love everything. (laughs) And I'm like, well, not really, it's just I don't go off about what I don't like. One of the things about uh, it's always been the way with your music, it's either that it, it either demands complete concentration or it sort of forces complete concentration. Do you know what I mean? It either requires it first, or when you're listening to it, you, you get sucked in, and it sort of begins to demand it. They're all long tracks, they're very long, they're very dense. Do you seek that, or is that just the way it's ended up? I mean, is that sort of focus that's required to really absorb your stuff? Uh, was, was that an aspiration, or is it just something that's ended up that way? Well, I mean... The pace of the music anyway, I mean, if you took any album at 45 and play it at 33, the song's instantly going to be longer. Um, so, I mean, I think pace adds to the heft of the length of a song, but I've always thought of us, you know, if we even are a doom metal band, um, we're doomed for ADD. Mm-hmm. Like, we don't like to just ride one riff incessantly or... Um, we adhere to traditional song structure a little bit, but we really like things to kind of go off and be unpredictable too, and mm-hmm. just have constant little changes. And whether they be vocal structure or a guitar line or a drum pace, or but you know, having lots of constant evolution within the song mm-hmm. so that it, it hopefully stays interesting. Mm-hmm. And I know for some people, it's still we fail for them, and that's fine. You know, we're just you know, at the end, of the, you know, we're just trying to write music by ourselves that you know that we're excited about and um, but the the length of the song is just the way we've always been I've tried to I've never tried to write a long song mm-hmm. I have tried to write a short song mm-hmm. for Yob and that's never worked it's never it just ever seems always seems like it's an intro yeah. and then it ends up becoming at ten least minutes. 10 minutes when all said and done I suppose within any given song and I know you must have heard this 20 times but within any given within any one Yob song it's almost like you are three people. You know what I mean? Hey, oh, you're fine. We're almost done. Yeah, We're almost, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, your, your variety, your range. You know, so that high on the early, particularly on the early. I mean, maybe in um, catharsis as well. That the higher voice or that personality was more prevalent. I think on the new one, maybe it's gotten a bit, bit more brutish. Um, how many voices are there in your head? I mean, what are you expressing with these lots, different voices? Yeah, yeah, lots and lots. Um, yeah, I mean, that higher voice is coming back a bit more. Um, though, you know, the the higher voice back in the early, early days, it was very falsetto. It didn't have a lot of, like, technical, like, like support underneath it, so it was very eerie. And I think as I've become a better, kind of more trained singer, I've leaned away from that mm-hmm. and opted for more, you know, supported vocals and, you know... I can still hit very high notes, but I just don't feel inspired by them as much mm-hmm. as I used to. I suppose um, what I'm asking is, are they are they voices of different characters in a way, no. or are they all the one uh, voice, one one character? Yeah, it's not characters. It's at all. Um, it's not like good cop, bad cop, or something yeah. like that. It's it's more um, just certain vibes, intentions, and releases that just seem to call for. You know, it's like, you know, guitars hitting different pedals, yeah, sure. you know, it's for me, that's the same thing, or, or hitting different gears, yeah. um, and 
if I was restricted to just one style of vocal, I, I would feel very limited by that. And whether it be just a scream or just a death roar or just clean singing. Mm -hmm. um, though, I probably work my, on my clean singing the hardest out of everything. Mm -hmm. um, I spend the most time at home trying to improve that. I, was, I think about a year ago, um, I was talking, I was doing an interview with Steve Von Till. He just put out his new album, which is just incredible. I said to him, what are you most excited about? And he said, Yob. Um, you've obviously, you know, you're on, you're on and stuff like that. Um, labels are hugely important things. How important has the partnership with yourself and Steve been? Because obviously the neurosis influence is, you know, all over your music, but how important is that creative mentorship, I suppose you could call it, or support? Yeah, well that mentorship started the first time I heard Pain of Mind, you know, and, uh, you know, a long time ago. And there's a period of time where I wasn't completely on board with where they went. I was mm -hmm. such a, because Pain of Mind was the first neurosis I heard and it was the first thing they'd ever mm -hmm. put out too. And so at the time it was just so vital and mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. than all the other hardcore I was hearing that when they started doing you know, word is law, it mm -hmm. just really took a left turn and I wasn't ready for it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until years later that uh, um, a friend turned me on to Times of Grace mm -hmm. and I went, oh shit, you know, and then all of a sudden all these pieces of the puzzle started coming together and I was like, I'm an idiot. And, um, and then I've been really on board ever since. And having slowly befriended Steve and Scott over, you know, many years, um, they, I mean, they exemplify just in, you know, integrity and a sense of honesty that is really true to themselves and, um, and they are unwavering in their artistic vision and they will not, um, they will not ever sell it short or um, do anything that could harm it. Mm -hmm. And that is an example for everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and then being able to work with them on a personal level. I mean, I've handed in albums to a lot of labels and handed records in to Brian Slagle. Um, records that I grew up on that, that he put out and Metal Blade but I was never as nervous as I was handing over the masters <laughs> to Steve Von Till of whom signed us without hearing one demo or one single note of the music. And what was the quality that he saw in you that he felt able to do that? Um, they just I think you know Scott was into us before Steve was and I think Great Cessation was what perked his ears and so at that point he had, they invited us to play some shows with him and he watched us play live and went yeah we're you know just in his words like yeah we have a we have a you know we're different bands but we have a similar mm -hmm. I think approach or a I'll thought continue that, there, yeah, yeah the way that we play and it's like well yeah we're I have to ask you what after we're, that we're, nervous wait uh what was the response when you handed that album? Um, yeah, I mean, they they were just supportive in every way. And um, supportive of every choice that we made. And um, though, you know, when, when Steve and I talk these days, you know, if we get on the phone, we, we hardly even talk about music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we just talk about other things, mm -hmm. you know, because that's all we, either one of us does. Wants to do, yeah. And... Uh, um, but, you know, being able to play the five shows that are coming up, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's just ever an honor to be, um, to be invited and um, any part of what they do. Clearing, we'll, we'll thank you um, for this, been great, we'll maybe wrapping this because I needed to go. Um, you have received quite some extraordinary critical response for Clearing the Path to Ascend, and you're already a sort of critically well-lauded band, but maybe Clearing the Path just blew that out of the water a bit. Um, any pressure about following that up? Do you, do you, does it sort of play on your mind, or are you just going to do what you do? If it does, it's passing, because, 
you know, we can't, you, you can't go back. You can't re try to recreate something. Um, you have to just move forward. And, and that usually, for the bands that do it well, they grow with each album. And the growth isn't just musically, it's people living, it's them digging into themselves, it's finding new sources of, of gold in, inside to, to bring to the music. And, um, and, you know, sometimes fans are on board and sometimes they're not. Mm -hmm. um, I know for me, the, the biggest example of it as far as coming around full circle for me was going from Rain and Blood to South of Heaven. Yeah. Because Rain and Blood was the penultimate aggressive album on the planet. Mm -hmm. There was nothing that touched it. Nothing. Mm -hmm. And nothing that came before it that was even remotely mm -hmm. what that mm -hmm. album was. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's always people now that are, want to have like some kind of revisionist history about how overrated it is, but they weren't yeah, there. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Most or of the time, yeah. they weren't there yeah. when it came out, yeah. and they weren't there to experience everything that led up to it, and how many of their favorite records, directly or indirectly, wouldn't exist mm -hmm. without that album. Mm -hmm. So it's like, all right, but. South of Heaven really threw me for a loop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as a fan, I was like, wow, that is just so drastically different. And I really just thought it was kind of rubbish. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it was years later that it just slowly was like sinking back into my bones. And now it's one of my very favorite of the Slayer yeah, albums. It's funny how that happens, isn't it? So, you know, and they weren't going to try to recreate Rain of Blood. Yeah. They're like, no, we gotta, we gotta move on. That's stuff to do, and that's also been true of Neurosis. You know, they're never satisfied. You know, they have to move on. Mm -hmm. um, I think Ohm's been that way. Yes. You know, Al has to move on. He's not satisfied to keep creating the same thing, even if everyone likes it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like you know, then at that point you start becoming like a product instead of yeah. art. Yeah. You know, yeah. instead of creating something that's splashing something new on the wall that you haven't splashed yet. Mm -hmm. And so that's our challenge, and that's on us. And all I can say is we won't put something out that we don't feel 100% about. And whether, you know, when we put it out there, you know, I think anyone, when you put your music out there, in a way, you don't have a say anymore. You don't get to say how people receive it. You don't get to say whether they like it or not. You don't get to put your spin on it and then have them, you know, you can't explain it. Mm -hmm. You just have to be it. And then it's out of your hands music has a life of its own mm -hmm. that in a way has nothing to do with the people who created it Mike Scheid telling it like it is. There are no artistic compromise. That's what bands like Yob are all about, and that's what makes them so intriguing and so fantastic. If you haven't heard Yob before, I really would recommend Clearing the Path to Ascend. What a what a Moorish and, and, and fulfilling album. So that's about it for episode 29 of the Metal Insight podcast from Metal Ireland. Just a couple of things to tell you about that have been on site this week. What have we got? Well, I've dragged a classic album from the vaults. Uh, that's Cryptopsy and their album Whisper Supremacy. You know what? Everyone talks about non so vile, and of course they talk about non so vile. But this was an amazing album back in 1998. Absolute hammer hard album. You got to listen to it, uh, remember it for the steamroller of an album that it was. So we've dug that from the vaults. Um, i got to tell you as well about a new vinyl that's out that you'll really want to get your hands on. It's from Ireland's uh, death metal band Zealot Cult, who sound really incredibly like uh, old Pestilence, Morbid Angel Obituary, that kind of thing. They've got a new album out on Blood Harvest Records. It's a vinyl version of their Carmenian Crypt uh, MLP from earlier this year. You can get it on Black Heavyweight Vinyl or Electric Blue Vinyl. You can get that from Blood Harvest Records, and I'd really recommend it. It's it's a fantastic release. Uh, I reviewed it some, some months back, and I was just struck by how incredibly vintage it sounded. It really is the real deal. So we'll have another podcast very shortly. Uh, I've 
I've uh, I've enjoyed putting this one together with uh, meeting Mike and talking to him about all those cool things. I'm Earl Grey. I'll be back shortly. Keep reading Metal Ireland over and out. <laughs>